One last thing about virtual axes is we have these methods get button down, get button, and there's also get button up, which is not seen here. And for these methods, you specify a virtual axis, and what you go back is a Boolean value, either true or false, and you get true when the axis value is non-zero, but only non-zero due to button or key input. It'll never be true because of joystick access input or because of mouse access input, only because of buttons and keys. So here in our code, um, we're querying get button down horizontal. That'll be true in the first frame where we push one of the keys that causes the horizontal value to be uh, either positive or negative, just anything other than zero. Um, whereas get button will be true in every frame where the horizontal virtual access value is non-zero thanks to button or key input. And then we also have this fire one access, which is defined here, let's oh, fire one. There's fire one defined for joystick button zero, and there's fire one defined for left control and also mouse zero. So let's play the game here. Okay, so there's our fire one event because mouse zero is bound for fire one. And so we got first the fire one down. And then as we held it down for a little bit on subsequent frames, we got these, uh, we see fire one. That's from, that's from the get button rather than get button down. That's what all these subsequent logs are from. Let me just refocus again. And for the horizontal, A and D are both mapped. I can hit A or D or left arrow or right arrow because those are all bound as buttons for the horizontal axis. But if I take my gamepad here where the left stick X axis is mapped to the horizontal virtual axis, I can go left and right here and nothing's happening because as far as the get button and get button down and up methods are concerned, it doesn't count. So again, there's the stock pop-up window at the start of a Unity game where you can map your inputs for the virtual axes. Well, if in your game logic, you just use get access or get button down and get button up, if you just use those four methods for all of your input queries, then the user should be able to, from that menu, reconfigure their input however they like. And you don't have to write your own key binding menu. That is the idea. On the other hand, if you're going to do your own key binding menu in game, you're probably better off querying input through get key using key codes, because remember you can query mouse buttons and uh, joystick buttons through those, except for joystick access movement and mouse movement input, you're going to have to handle that through virtual axes and then somehow in your game logic, allow the user to configure those inputs how they like. Like say they should be able to invert their axes if they so choose. It's a little awkward and it doesn't seem to be what they had in mind when they designed Unity, but it totally can be done. And as I mentioned, we should be getting a new input system sometime in the next year, which should address these problems. Now, what if we want our game to have cursor-driven input? Well, actually by default, we have an enabled cursor. In fact, I'm going to hear Builder Game and run it in full screen. And we still have a visible cursor here, even in full screen mode. And in fact, I can just mouse out of the window onto my second monitor. You can't see that, but I'm just uh, moving the mouse over to my other monitor here. So I'm quit out of here. We can disable the visibility of the cursor through the cursor class, which has a static property called visible, which will set to false. Its default value is true, but now we'll set it false in the start method of our script. And so now, if I play the game, even in the editor now, when the cursor enters the window, it is hidden as long as it's within the window. It's still there logically, it's just you don't see that. So here it pops out over here. What I might want to do though is confine my cursor to the window. And I can do that by setting the lock state property, which is expecting the cursor lock mode enum value. The default is none, such that I can just freely move the cursor in and out of my window even when it's full screen assuming I have multiple monitors, but then if I make it confined, when I run my game and give it focus, the cursor will be stuck within the confines of the window. I can't just mouse out. We want the cursor to be visible, so I'll comment that out, save my code, come back here, and within the editor, I don't think the setting has any effect. I think it just gets overridden, so I give focus here, and yeah, I, I'm not sure it actually even does anything in the editor, but if you run the game as a proper standalone, and run it in windowed mode here, 1080 windowed, play, and okay, game loads up, and okay, my cursor's confined, but unexpectedly, we tab out and we tab back, and oh wait, my, my cursor's free now. I think what happens is that anytime you tab out, the cursor lock mode gets reset to none. 
So what we want to do is we want to reassert every time we give focus back to the application, we want to reassert the lock mode to being confined. And we can do that in an event called uh, on application focus. There it stubs that out for us. And then when focus is true, this is fired, I believe, both when you leave focus and gain focus. And so when focus is true, that means we've just gained focus. And so we want to just reassert this to be confined. And this should fix our problem. I'll quit the game, rebuild. <clears throat> and play in a window. It's loading up. Cursor's not confined until that initial start. But now it's confined. It's a little weird how it kind of pokes out at the bottom here. I don't know if there's a way to address that. Um, anyway, tab out, come back, and I'm reconfined. In fact, let's see, I'll tab out and make sure the cursor is not within the window confines. If I tab back, it snaps my cursor back within bounds. There we go. So that's probably what we want if we're doing a cursor-driven game. And I'm going to quit this out. I'm going to assume that on application focus fires like within the first frame when our game loads up. I believe that's the case. I'm going to curious. Let's, let's try that make sure that's the case. So I'm going to build again. Make sure my cursor is outside the window. See what happens when the game loads up. Play. Are you going to snap my cursor in? Yeah, it gets snapped in. Okay, so on application focus does fire on that first frame. So that's good. So we don't need it in our start, just in that one method. And aside from confined and none, there's also locked. Locked will actually override visible. When you're in the lock state, your cursor is never visible, but it also locks it to the center of the game window. So here we're just gonna play the game again. See what happens. And yeah, see our cursor's disappeared and now it's stuck in the middle. This is probably the setting we want for like a first person shooter or most any game where we just want to totally disable the cursor. The reason you want locked mode rather than just cursor.visible equals uh, false and confined, you would think this is the same thing, but there's one little detail that makes that undesirable. Run in windowed mode. And okay, as soon as the game starts up, okay, my cursor's disappeared. It's confined to the window. I can't drag it out. Very small thing here. It'll be evident in a second. If I drag my cursor up to the rightmost window, up, oh, see that? My cursor is invisible, but it's actually over the window bar. And so I could very easily, on accident, maybe I'm using my mouse for like first person shooter controls input. Um, if I'm going to click right now, close my game. So that's why you want to lock your cursor for like a first person shooter rather than just make it invisible and confined. Something you'll probably want to do if you have a cursor in your game is set what the cursor looks like rather than just having your system default like this arrow. And to do that, you'll import a texture to use as your cursor icon. Uh, I brought in this hand ping right here and I set the texture type to cursor. It's default by default, but I set it to cursor make sure to then apply that change. And then, so we can have access to this texture in our code. There are ways we'll talk about later where you can just programmatically refer to assets from your code, but the simplest way to do it now is that for our manager script, I've added a property called cursor texture, and I've dragged the hand to that field. And in the code, what that is, it's this public field of type texture 2D. And that's the simplest way to get a handle to a texture in the script. And so now if I want to use that cursor texture to set on my cursor, uh, I call this method, the cursor static method set cursor, I specify first the texture we're gonna be using. This is specifying the mode of how the cursor is drawn, whether it's done in hardware or software. The, that distinction between hardware and software cursors, um, I, I won't get into here, uh, but we generally want auto. There's really never much of a reason to use software anymore these days. So we'll just make this auto. And this argument in the middle is a vector two value. A vector two is like a vector three, but there's only an X, Y chord rather than also a Z chord. So this is X of zero and Y of zero. And this is specifying where on the texture icon we want the clicking point to be. You can have a cursor texture that looks like whatever you want, like say a hand, and then you need to specify what the coordinate of like the tip of the, the pointing finger is because that's not necessarily the very top left of your texture. On the hand icon I've chosen, 
the coordinate I want is somewhere over here. I don't even know what the dimensions of my hand icon is. It's like 100 by 100 or something. So this is probably X of 50, 60, I don't know, and then a Y of about 0. That's probably what I want from a coordinate, but I'm just going to leave it 0, 0, because we don't care right now. So I'm going to save this, and we don't want to lock our cursor state, and we definitely want our cursor to be visible, so let's comment that out. And now let's run the game. And we should see the change in the editor even. So my regular cursor, but as soon as I drag into the window, now it's changed to my custom hand icon. And let's just verify this. Let's run this as a windowed application and see this in action. Play. And then there we go. There's our hand icon. And I assume if we tab out, the cursor gets set back to its default. That's why we're setting the cursor in an on application focus event because we want to make sure it gets reasserted every time we give our application focus. I assume that's the case. I'd actually have to test to make sure that's actually necessary. But this seems to be working. The only thing not proper right now is that when I click, the click point is not the tip of the finger. It's actually the top left of the image. So it's kind of floating off in space there. We would want to adjust that coordinate so it lines up with the tip of our, our index finger here. Last but not least, we of course want to read the position of our cursor in our game window. And we can do that with the static property of input called mouse position. It returns a vector three in which the x, y values are the x, y coordinates within our game window where the cursor is positioned, with zero, zero being the bottom left and the top right of our window being determined by the resolution. If our resolution is 1920 by 1080, then the top right of our window is 1920, 1080. And in fact, when we read the mouse position, if our cursor is outside the bounds of the window, we still get a coordinate. So if our cursor is to the bottom left of our game window, it'll actually be negative x and y values. And if our cursor is above and to the right of the top right of our game window, then the x and y values will actually exceed our, our current resolution. So let's see this in action. In our update, when I click the mouse button down for the primary mouse button, we're going to get the current mouse position and log it out. So let's just see that in action play and then hover over the window and if I click we're getting yeah strangely we get a vector three but the z core is just always zero so it's a little strange there but that's how it works and I don't think here because I'm relying on a click within the window it shouldn't do anything when I click outside of it I'm pretty sure yeah so uh, the way I wrote the code is we could only see the coordinates within the window but here so bottom left that should be about zero zero okay yeah and then it seems like our window right now the resolution is something like 900 by a little over 500. Here, let's actually make the logging unconditional. So it'll just print out every frame. It'll flood our log a bit, but then you'll be able to see that when it recompiles. So now you see the mouse position, as you can see, is exceeding our total resolution. And if I could sneak down here below the bottom left, am I getting, yeah, I'm getting a negative Y value at least there. I'd have to move this window over and then put my mouse down here. And are we getting, oh, well, there. Okay, yeah, see the X and Y now are negative.